Navanatama Krona, Episode 1, here we'll be discussing the venologist Sauvignon Blanc and trying to get to grips with how Zoom works. Welcome to the first edition of Navanatama of Krona. And this is exciting for me because I feel that this is something that can actually go further than just sitting around while we're in isolation. Maybe it's something we can carry on doing post this whole crazy thing they're dealing with at the moment. Um, so I've never used Zoom before. And I think um, the, the way to run this is, is now is just have the chat. This idea spawned on me because we were sitting and having a, a bottle of wine and then Nats and um, Craig were having a bottle of wine and then they sent us a picture of their bottle of wine. Then we sent them a picture of our bottle of wine and we started discussing the wine. And then I thought, well, why don't we all discuss the same wine and get a whole lot of people to do it? And Nats has helped. And so this is where, where, where we are. Um, and I think you all know me, so I've done bits and bobs with wine for some time. When I arrived in Cape Town, my mom told me, no, listen, Harry, you're not going to be able to make friends in Cape Town. It's quite clicky, and you're a little bit too introverted. So to overcome my fear of people and to learn about wine and to get out and to make friends, I started Harry's Big Wine Adventure, which has been going for eight years now. And now I'm not scared of too many people. I've learned about wine. I sometimes get out and I'm still working on the friends. Um, my philosophy is simple. Wine is a social tool. It's meant to bring people together, meant to help people engage, have a couple of glasses that makes you clever. And um, it's all about that. And it's actually not about the price of the wine. It's not about the technical stuff that's in the wine. Whether it's a 50 rand bottle of wine or whether it's a thousand rand bottle of wine, it's always, sorry, it's always a social tool to accompany meals, to get people to engage with each other, look at each other in the eye, even though we're doing this over Zoom, and talk, even though I've got you all on mute. Okay, um, so another philosophy of mine is that the wines I choose aren't the wines with all the labels, and they aren't dictated by the price points. They're more about the stories behind the wines, the stories behind the wine producers, the history, the stories behind the wine makers, the stories behind that specific wine. And um, so in going through all of this, I'm gonna be talking about stories. I'm not gonna tell you how many balling sugar and acid and stuff. I'm not doing that, you're all full of sleep, if you haven't already. Okay, the Vinologist wine is a wine that's come from the Buchenholz Kloof wine producer, that, that business. I don't know if you guys know Buchenholz Kloof. It's one of the most successful wineries in the country. It's one wine, make, wine producer of the year a couple of times. This year, it's um, the editor's choice in Platter for being the, for being the, um, the winery of the year. So if you don't know Book and Kloof, they also do the ranges like Porcupine Ridge, Wolf Trap. Craig, you'll know Wolf Trap from Cafe Roo. And, they, and the most commercially successful wine, the, the Chocolate Block. Um, and this is just another one of the range. What Phenologist is about is they're finding site-specific wine. And this is a Sauvignon Blanc, and it comes from the Cape Town region. Now the Cape Town region is a newly a Cape Town district. Sorry, it's a newly it's a newly defined district. It only came in, into being in 2017. Before then, it was the the Cape Peninsula, and that encompasses obviously Constantia, Newark, Hart Bay, Durbanville, and Philadelphia. And the thing with all these regions is that they've got close proximity to the ocean. They've got slopes, and it's perfect for Sauvignon Blanc, which is a cool climate type of grape. And that's why you get such good Sauvignon Blancs in Constantia and these regions. Durbanville, you'll know as well. Sauvignon Blanc is, it comes from, it comes from, um, it comes from France. It's, it's grown in the Loire Valley and Bordeaux Valley, but it's also made a name for itself in New Zealand, where it's pungent and it's got the flavors of the wildest gooseberries from the wildest um, Marlborough. And they've now managed to diversify a bit and do Pinot Noir, but New Zealand is known. They, 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 the Sauvignon Blanc put them on the map. The grapes, um, as I said, for this comes from Cape Town. A little bit about Sauvignon Blanc as a grape. Sauvignon Blanc is a fresh grape. Nine times out of ten, it's made to be drunk fairly young. It's crisp. It's got high acidity. It's dry. The aromas, depending on how it's made from a cool climate to a warmer climate, go from green, so green bell pepper, to cut grass, cat's pee. I don't know if you guys smell cat's pee. Um, if you guys got cats, go smell some cat's pee. Sometimes that comes up through here. Um, you get canned asparagus peas. Um, 
and then it gets to figs and to gooseberries and then more to the tropical fruits of um, pineapple and granadilla. So that's, that's just a little bit about the grape. What do you think of this wine? Let's go through it. Okay. It's, great. it's actually nice. It's Are we only today? Yeah, you, know, you see the wines that I've chosen are on average about 100 rand a bottle. This, um, this Sauvignon Blanc for me, it's, you can smell it Sauvignon Blanc or maybe you can't. But uh, for me, it's got a bit of lime. It's got a bit of gooseberry. Oh, it's got mm. a bit of um, fig. And um, it's fresh and it's dry. And it is what a Sauvignon Blanc says it should do. Um, it should be drunk in the nice sunny sunny climate, but it's raining. It's I don't know where all you guys are from, um, but it's it's raining. So, But it's still cool. Um, keep it chilled. If you want to add ice, add ice. From an academic point of view and from a French point of view, it's a no-no. But I say enjoy your wine how you should. If you like it. Can you some food pairings for it? So I would, I would definitely have this with salads, sort of asparagus. So you don't drink it that often then? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, I don't. You could also have it with like a, like a risotto with lime. You could have it with fish and lime and that citrusy kind of fish. I wouldn't have it with crumb fish, but yeah. Even maybe with chicken, but I would say more shenan and, and chardonnay for that. Harry, are there any stories that are associated with this wine that you can tell us? Mark Kent is the winemaker at um, Buchenhoed's Kroof. And he's put up something which is potentially one of the best marketable wine producers in the country, besides Canon Corp. The Buchenhoed's Kroof range at the top is really, really impressive. Um, it's won so many awards, as I said. The wine producers won winery of the year, but they've also managed to diversify into okay. the more lifestyle drinking ranges like Wolf Trap, Porcupine Ridge. There you go. And um, the, the chocolate block is overseas and it's, it's probably the most commercially successful premium wine in South Africa. Um, maybe Canon Corp there too. So, that, I mean, I don't know any stories specifically about Mark Kent. Um, the wines I chose for this, the Vinologist, was because it's got a bloody nice label. Uh, I think so. And um, because it was, uh, I could get it in pick and pay. So the story is the reason why I chose pick and pay is because you could, you're supposed to be able to order it online and not get people sick. When I tried to order it online, they said, yeah, you can get it in the middle of April. So then I went in and I dodged people and I had a stick that I used to poke people so that they could get out of my way. And I managed to get some bottles. That's the story on the venologist. <laughs> Debs, how's your wine? Mm -hmm. Debs is drinking out the bottle. That's great. So okay. we got two questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I just, I said in the chat, why don't you tell everybody a bit about your background and how you got into wine and that kind of stuff because there are people that not really don't really know the, the the story okay i mean i can easily tell that if i can remember it um <laughs> i i've I started tasting wine at a very young age and i think it's if you're drinking wine you're studying wine surely so i've been studying wine for a long time um and then one day i decided to do a course uh, this was in 2000, I did a Cape Wine Academy course. And then I did another one. And then I went overseas and I did a UK course. And then I came back and I did a lot of courses. And then I started Harry's Big Wine Adventure. And then ultimately um, I ended up becoming a Cape Wine Master. And with that, I became the head of the Cape Wine Academy. So they do the wine education within South Africa for wine. And and even now, I'm still studying wine because it's, it's delicious. And yeah, I've just learned something. I could have more of this, for instance. I've just learned that I can have more of this. So you never stop learning with wine, you know. And that's why I end up now. I give a lot of tours. So I give high-end wine tours to people from the States and from the UK through a company called Escape and Explore. Those have all dried up. 
So all of them have been cancelled, which is interesting because now all the wines I bought for them, I have to use in lockdown. I give tastings to specific groups. I do wine education, wine lectures um, as part of the Cape Wine Academy. And um, yeah, I'm working on some other things. So that's my story. I want to know how, um, how much influence does a label have for a bottle of wine? Like, do you, do you find people sometimes buy wine just because of the label, or do you think they're actually going out and deciding on what particular wine to buy? So, you know, so they've got a wine label competition. And if you look at most of the wine labels, if you go into Pick and Pay, or if you go into Woolies, they're all largely, 90% of them look the same. So having a different label is definitely attractive, and especially for the creative types and, and for those. I've definitely had experiences where I've taken someone, I've sent them a wine, and I think that this wine's amazing, and, and they go, oh, what a terrible label. Are you sure this wine's okay? So a bad label is bad. A good label, I think, is attracting. Um, I think, you know, regardless of the label or the wine, the majority of the people have go-to wines that they have. And it's the wines that everyone takes to the same price. They'll never expand. Now, hopefully with this, we'll taste a whole lot of Sauvignon Blancs. And you can say, listen, I quite like that. Let's just go buy more. You know, there's a lot of different wines. Harry, I've got a question from my daughter. She's saying, what do you think of the new pop culture? What was it? Like the new wave of like pop culture labels instead of... The refined... Yeah, rather some simple, fancy... I love them. I love, I, I dig it a lot. I like the Swatland. I like Spider Pig. I like all these new wines by the can with their retro colors. I think it's all amazing. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, all the labels are trying to look French and they, they get lost. And so if you've got a standout label, I like all this new way of marketing. I like the millennial approach um, or the marketing to the millennials. I like, um, it's seriously disrupting the whole industry. But I think it's good. Yeah, Harry, I remember, uh, do you remember, was it Utter Bastard or uh, Fat Bastard? Yeah. It was that Chardonnay. That that was the first <laughs> yes. I remember a completely different style of labeling with wines was, um, was the Chardonnay called Fat Bastard. Do you remember that? Yes. yes. So Fat Bastard. And, and then they went, yeah, and then they went on to Utter Bastard, which was the Shiraz. And that was the first time I think, I saw sort of wine step out of their very traditional French style. It was quite funky. Sure. That was a long and time fat, ago. Fat bastard <laughs> was great because fat is a play on the words fat, which means it's got some substance to it, you know. Fat means, um, yeah, so um, I like the fat bastard. Um, there's a lot of labels now. You know, I think when you get to some of the top producers, they're still trying to keep it classical. Harry, what's the oldest wine you've ever drunk? I've drunk lots of wines Before. older than me. Um, <laughs> when I graduated, we were drinking wines that were older than 19. I'm not going to give up my, you know, when I say wines older than me, I mean like 25 <laughs> wines. Um, so, um, no, I've drunk wines old. I've drunk 19, uh, 1970s South African wines. I've drunk even older international wines. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not for everyone. The profile changes completely. But, geez, it's cool. If you stand up and you say, this wine's actually older than me, and you think about it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. What's the question, Mike? My question is, what yeah. do you think about putting ice in white wine? I think it's awesome. <laughs> but can I ask you a question? Why don't you, free, why don't you pour wine into your ice tray and make wine ice blocks? And then when you, That's a very good idea. And then you've got... Like yeah. Harry, you do, you do realize you're making work for me. I was about to just sit down. Eh? Okay, well, quickly go get some ice. <laughs> uh, Harry, we thoroughly enjoying this wine. Well done. Yeah, well, I, I, I've never tasted it before, so it's good luck, I think, that it's good. <laughs> you know, what I do want to say to everyone actually is, you know, if you are one of those people that are stuck on your normal brands, if you just go to that price point and you order the same wines, it gives you such, don't be scared, just try them. I mean, yeah, you might be 80 rand out of pocket, but it's not going to be vastly different. It gives you more stuff and then start Googling, find out the stories, find out what's going on. It's pretty cool.
um, and it, it starts to expand your knowledge or not <laughs> but um, for me uh, I'm still studying so I need to learn you know learning about wine is the best thing because you can take yourself away you go buy yourself six bottles of wine you sit in the room you say please don't disturb because I'm studying you walk out about an hour later and then they say oh, what happened you said yeah got it all right so Craig did Nats leave you um, yeah, she got a call, but um, she should be back soon. And then she rushed up and stood on one of the nets. <laughs> followed the, she followed the cat, the one cat upstairs. She's back. Nets, Nets, did you stand on the cat? Do we like this wine? Yeah. <laughs> We yeah. like it. We like any wine, though. Yeah, we like anything, as long as it's with friends. <laughs> okay, cool. That's the most important thing. That's why it's a social tool, and that's why it's meant to bring people together and have conversation. And yeah, and there you have it. Um, uh, I'm just cutting it short because you can see that um, the first session really did start messy, um, uh, but we started it, and uh, that's the most important thing. It was the first of the Love and Time of Corona sessions. We were learning how to work with Zoom, learning how to speak to each other, learning about um, how the flow of the session should go. And, you know, you can even see all the editing in that version. And I've cut off now 45 minutes to an hour long of people bantering. You know, it was also very much more social in the beginning where people weren't able to get out so it was just having drinks the group started off with a bunch of people who knew each other and this has now expanded to being broader and um, with a lot more people on and and people have actually met and um, uh, met each other on this platform and it's growing and it's and it's great so something i'm very proud of it's the first one although messy it's there and we go on to the next one <laughs>